Arsenal versus Liverpool coming up this weekend at Emirates Stadium in the third round of the FA Cup. In years gone by, this would have been seen as a massive FA Cup tie, but I guess with the other sides having, I guess you could argue, bigger fish to fry because of the Champions League. In Arsenal's case, Liverpool obviously feel that they can win the Premier League title. Maybe this has fallen a little bit down the priority list, but it's a big, big game for Arsenal, especially Rory, because... You know, as you've been pointing out quite a lot on videos over the last few days, which I've taken issue with, <laughs> Arsenal have gone from top at Christmas to fourth uh, in the new year. Yes, top at Christmas, fourth on New Year's Day. It's a, it's another record for Arteta. I mean, that's completely <laughs> unacceptable. And the reason why it's such a big game for both teams, I, I don't necessarily think the fact that both sides have other priorities, both sides are competing for trophies on multiple fronts, I don't think that's going to have an impact. I think the re when the referee blows the whistle and this game starts, this will be a pulsating third round clash. Both teams will be desperate to succeed. And it's the FA Cup. People will sneer at it. People will say that it's maybe lost its magic. But let's face it, it's Arsenal versus Liverpool in the FA Cup. Whoever wins is going to be not only a step closer, obviously because they're in the next round, but they're a step closer because a giant has gone out. I, I agree with you that once the whistle blows, both sides will be... Bang on it. No doubt about that. Does it impact the team selection, though? The fact that Liverpool specifically have a semi-final to come in midweek. And then, of course, um, you know, both sides have a, a bit of a period off there. I think Liverpool have got 11 days after the semi-final. Mm. Arsenal have got a bit longer. Or does the fact that there is that window there of no football, essentially, mean that both managers are going to go all in from the off? I could be wrong here, but I don't think it matters. I honestly don't think it matters. I, wouldn't, I, I don't think it would matter... If if there was like a huge game in the Champions League coming up for both teams, I think that this is the FA Cup. You're going against you know a, a, a seriously prestigious opposition, and you have to win the game. If you think about it, for Liverpool, Liverpool will be desperate for win it to to win this for many of their own reasons. For Arsenal, they'll be desperate to win it for many of their own reasons. Plus the fact that they've lost two consecutive London derbies, they can't lose three in a row. Three in a row becomes symbolic. It becomes, it becomes crisis-like. Does the outcome of this have an impact on the title race? No, I don't think that. I don't think it does. I think it. I think it will be very damaging to Arsenal. I think Liverpool can just about get away with a defeat. I don't think it will be particularly huge for them. They'll be gutted, but they can. They can regroup and go again. For Arsenal, it will be the statement that they need to get back on track. You know, lose to West Ham, lose to Fulham, knock Liverpool out the club. Cup, you are back on track. You have sorted yourself out. You have realigned. So I think I think a defeat for Arsenal would be very nothing really short of a catastrophe. Is that too much? Do you agree with what I'm saying here? I don't agree that it'll be a catastrophe. It's three defeats in a row. I think teams have blips. I think team and, and if you ask Arsenal fans who watched this blip happen back in March, April last year, would they rather it happen now or at that stage? I think they'd take it now. But the impact could be the same. The impact could be the same, yes, but it's it's at a different point in the season. You want to finish stronger at the end of the season. You want to be in a position where you end giving it your all. And, you know, last season, Arsenal had the blip later on, and it was when Manchester City were in top gear. Mm. Now, you could argue that right now they're not in top gear just yet, or they haven't been in recent yeah. weeks. So wouldn't you rather have it before they click I mean, if you're gear? gonna if you're going to have it, you want to have it at a point where there's time to recover. The problem is, if you go out of the cup, lose the two games that you've lost, it could be unassailable anyway. Just on, when we were doing the intro here, you said another record for Mikel Arteta, the fact that Arsenal were top at Christmas mm. and, and fourth on New Year's Off Day. Off the back of being top of the league for as many millions of days that they were without winning the league. Reading between the lines with what you're saying, it suggests to me that you think that Mikel Arteta is partly to blame for what's going on at Arsenal over the course of the yeah. last two weeks. Um, I know you've been very critical of Kai Havertz. Um, I watched a video that, that you did the other day uh, or that you were in the other day and there was a, a lot of analysis about Arsenal that I have to say I thought was lazy. Mm -hmm. I thought that some of the things that people were putting forward as the reasons for Arsenal not being as good as they maybe were last season or even three, four weeks ago were completely wrong. So what is it that you think has gone wrong? Why is Mikel Arteta partly to blame? And, and let's, let's have the debate. Well, Arteta hasn't solved the problems that exist at the team, which is his responsibility. His responsibility is to manage difficult situations. And the difficult situation that has materialised of late is the fact that his two mercurial, at various points, dazzling forwards, the two wide forwards that are top-tier players, borderline elite-level players, they're not firing. He needs to come up with a reason why. And I think there are many reasons as to why it's not working. Partly because they were so brilliant last year. 
it's difficult to go again. Partly because they're so young. Partly because teams will have worked them out. You know, if you can stop Martinelli, you will stop Arsenal. If you can stop Saka, you will stop Arsenal. But what Arteta hasn't managed to do, and bearing in mind these players are so young, the blip was always going to come. He needed to do two things. Firstly, work out a situation where when it comes... You, you get through it. You find a different way. You find a different angle. But equally, various transfers that they have nearly gone for, nearly got. Mikhailo Mudrik is an example. I'm not saying I'm not saying that Mikhailo Mudrik would have flown at, uh, at Arsenal. He's been a distinctly average player for Chelsea. But there is a statement about the fact that they wanted Mudrik and they didn't get him. They wanted Joao Felix. Remember when Joao Felix came to Chelsea? Yeah, but they they, they wanted a winger. Yeah, they they went after Mikhailo Mudrik because they wanted a winger, mm. and they ended up getting Leandro Trossard. Yeah, who, it's a different style of winger though. He cuts in all the time. It's a different style of winger, but it's still a player for that position. It's not the player you wanted though. It's the player that you wanted on the B list. So, can you say now with any confidence that Mikhailo Mudrik would have brought something better to Arsenal than Leandro Trossard has? I, I've never seen Mikhailo Mudrik have a good game to be totally. But frank there you me. go. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what I've seen. Mikel Arteta obviously believed that Mikhailo Mudrik was the answer, and he didn't get his player. Then Joao Felix, they didn't get his player. Uh, Neto from Wolves, we've constantly heard about this. Allowing Pepe to leave, uh, for, f- particularly for the pitiful uh, return. Again, I believe that was a mistake. These are Arteta mistakes. I, 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 I you can't prepared. say that letting Nicolas Pepe, who has been branded as one of the biggest flops in Premier League history, but for £72 million. Pounds I, I was... don't agree. I think he was a good player. I think he was a good player. Probably not the level that you needed him to be, but allowing him to leave and not replacing him directly, not having... Not having players that are capable of deputising for uh, Martinelli on one side and Saka on the other is a problem. You know when you sign Kai Havertz, you spend 65 million quid on a player like Havertz. That player, when you signed him at least, was the kind of player at Chelsea that was playing in those positions. You signed a player for 65 million quid who wasn't better than any of the players that you had at your club. That's bad. That's, that's is it, the, bad the, the Kai Havertz stuff is, it, it was maybe relevant three months ago. If you'd have sat here opposite me three months ago and we were having the discussion around whether Kai Havertz has been a useful acquisition or not, I would have defended him because he's an Arsenal player and I would have wanted to give it more time. But I could have understood where you're coming from. I think Kai Havertz, over the last two, three months, has been one of Arsenal's, if not Arsenal's, better players. He's been right up there in terms of his performances. In the last Playing few in that games. midfield role. <laughs> He's been fantastic. He's been forget the I mean, last I two games. Him, I missed him. I watched him against Fulham. He didn't play against West Ham. He was suspended. No, no, I watched him against Fulham. Yep, yeah, but everybody was average against Fulham. Right, but so, he's a sixty-five million pound new signing. He's supposed to elevate everything. Everyone was over, everyone was average against Chelsea, and then Declan Rice takes the game by the scruff of the neck and drags you to to a point. Everyone was average against Manchester United. Declan Rice wins you the game. Everyone was average against Luton. Declan Rice wins you the game. Everyone's average against Fulham. And but the, but this, is the, this is the point. That this is where you're looking at it through the lens that suits you. Because the most important goal that Arsenal got at Luton to then go on and win it 4-3 was the goal that, Decl- uh, that Kai Havertz got, I beg your pardon, mm. to make it 3-3. He went and responded straight after Luton took the lead. And all of a sudden it was game on and Arsenal's patience told in the end. You know... There's been other games, Brentford away in the Premier League. Kai Havertz pops up with an important goal. Kai, Kai mm. Havertz has been fine. He's not the problem. The, the, he, he is the problem because the 65 million quid that you spent on him meant that you didn't spend 65 million pounds on a player that can deputise for Saka when he goes out of form, for Martinelli when he goes out of form. And that's why you've had to run them ragged. That's why you haven't been able to rotate. And that's why these young players are now burnt out, I think looking, looking clueless at times. The biggest problem for Arsenal this season... And, and the reason why you're not getting the best out of Saka and Martinelli, I accept that tired legs are a part of it. I accept that that's a part of the argument and a part of the issue. But the real problem is, is the speed with which Arsenal are progressing the ball through the midfield. It's not happening quickly enough. Mm. It's not happening quickly enough. Last season, you saw them break lines nice and early and create the one-on-one situations for Saka and for Martinelli, from which they did lots and lots of damage. Zinchenko was so good at doing that last season. Hasn't done it as well this season. Maybe because teams have sussed it out. Thomas Partey's key in that. Mm. Because for all the praise that Declan Rice gets, and he's brilliant, believe me, he's brilliant. He's not a ball progressor like Thomas Partey. He's a very different type of player. He wants to receive it, take two or three yeah, touches, yeah. carry it a little bit, and then he releases it. And in the meantime, you've allowed the opposition to retreat into a position that kills that space mm. in between the lines. But that's that Arsenal... tactical as well. Like yeah. Declan, Rice, Declan Rice would follow instruction. No, yeah. If Arteta said, get Agreed. release, receive release, he, he would do that. But it takes time sometimes to get a player to break old habits and do something new. Mm. I'm just conscious because we've got to talk uh, the Liverpool side of this as well. Um, 
first spell for Liverpool, this is going to be without Mohamed Salah. Um, more pressure on the shoulders of the likes of Darwin Nunez, who we've talked about um, a, a little bit earlier on. Been some suggestions that he would be better off the left wing rather than up front. I mean, is this Nunez's time to step up and make his mark for Liverpool in Salah's absence? I, I don't think so. I, don't, I, I think Liverpool are going to be fine. I remember having this conversation a couple of years ago to you. Do you remember when it was... Um, they're going to lose Salah, they're going to lose Mane, they're going to plummet. And they won every game. I think Jota ended up like a man possessed during that period. So, no, I don't think I don't think Liverpool will struggle. But I certainly don't think that Darwin Nunes is going to be the answer. I, I've kind of... I'm kind of done with Nunes. I think he's... I know what he's good at and I know what he... I know what he is and I know what he isn't. And what he isn't is the, the ruthless centre-forward that can lead the line for Liverpool for the next decade. That's not who he is. All the talk's been around... Uh, Darwin Nunez and you know him needing to step up to replace Mo Salah. Salah's going, of course, to the AFCON. Just really quickly in a couple of words, are we sort of ignoring the fact that actually Endo, who's also going off to the Asian Cup, has been really important for Liverpool in that deep line midfield position and will he be missed? Yeah, massively. I think they need to sign a midfielder. I think, you know, in this window, if you think about who Liverpool need to sign, I think the obvious thing is people go centre forward. But I actually think, you know, if they went and signed... I'm making this up, but say they went and signed Paulinho from Fulham. Could be the difference. Yeah. I think yeah. They, I think they suddenly, they're suddenly going to be able to cope in a very different way. I think people overlook the fact that the midfield still needs work because they did work on the midfield in the summer exactly. in terms of bringing players in. But it's not complete yet. I agree with you. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.